university's mission, as was um, shared before, communicating the principles and practices of spiritual psychology worldwide through the process of soul-centered education. So if I were you sitting out there, there'd be two sets of words that I'd want to know a little bit more about. Spiritual psychology and soul-centered education. What do they mean by that? So let's start with soul-centered education. So we begin that there is such a thing as a spiritual reality and that we start with the principle that a better description of us really, because we, we, uh, a lot of what we hear, well, I'd say I'm a person and I, I have a social dimension and I have a, a mental dimension and I have a spiritual dimension, as if the center was me and I have these various different aspects. And we're going to suggest to you that a better definition than us as human beings who have a soul is that we are souls having a human experience. That our very nature is spiritual. And here we are on this funny looking planet walking around this way, having these experiences. So we're souls having a human experience. That's what we mean by that. So we honor that and we work within that context. And we'll be sharing a lot more about uh, how we do that. So spiritual psychology, if you were to look up the word psyche in the dictionary, I mean, think of it, psychology would be the, uh, the ology of the, of the psyche. So if you were to look up psyche in the dictionary, you would find breath, principle of life, soul. Okay, so far so good. Breath, principle of life, soul. So you'd think the study of psychology would be about that, would you not? I would. In fact, I did, until I looked it up. <laughs> the science of mind and behavior. How did that happen? <laughs> what happened? Well, if you think about it from a standpoint of education, at least in this country, how do you really how do you really deal with something that is ethereal, like breath, principle of life, soul? How do you really, how do you build courses around that so people have that experience? But mind and behavior, we can study that. We can do studies. We can make definitions of stuff. And so in a way, it's not surprising that it, that it came down to that. But that's not what we mean when we talk about it here. So we talk about spiritual psychology as the study and practice of conscious awakening. Conscious awakening. And when people are, start asking or start inquiring within themselves, what is this awakening business? What does that mean? What is spiritual awakening? They usually are really asking themselves, a set of questions that goes like this. They're trying to become more aware of who, are, who am I? What is my essential nature? You know, is this thing that's going around doing stuff and thinking about stuff and having this, is that, these feelings, is that it? Is that my essential nature? Who am I really? And that question almost invariably is followed by why am I here? What is my purpose? What am I doing here? An important question. And people who ask that question are almost always asking a third question. How can I make a more meaningful contribution in my life or in my world? Now, what's interesting is that these days, at this particular time in the evolution of this planet and all the people living here, and those of you who are involved in some of the mystical teachings are well aware of this, we are at a very, very, very important time that has been talked about for thousands of years. It's a, not only an age change, it's a change having to do with the 26,000 year cycle. That's a long time. That's a huge thing 
we're living into that. That has a profound effect on everyone. It means that new energies are coming in. Something is struggling to be born in the midst of something that is struggling to keep from dying. In astrology, it's referred to as coming out of the Piscean Age into the Aquarian Age. Those are really energetic statements. They're not astrological statements. So we want to talk a little bit about uh, what this means and how we work with that. So you really get as clear an idea as you can about the context that we're working in. So if we were to look at physical world reality, what we find is that this is the reality. <coughs> this is very much of what I'll call a Piscean reality. This is the world that most of us live in. And it's characterized by striving from experiences that we don't like too well to experiences that we like better. That's probably in the broadest terms that I know of. So we want more money, we want a better job, we want a better relationship, we want a, all, of, all of these kinds of things. And this is the reality that the great preponderance of people on this planet are living in. Nothing wrong with that. And in fact, we're big supporters of that because it always seemed to us that the more you have, the more you have to share. Never been a big proponent of poor is pure. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. The more I have, the more I have to share. So we refer to this as the goal line of life because the, it's usually measured in, what are your goals? What do you want? And then we lay these things out and uh, we go for it. What's less readily understood is that while this is going on, there's a whole other reality going on at the same time that we refer to as spiritual reality. Spiritual reality. And spiritual reality is something that, believe it or not, every single one of the world's major religions is in total agreement about. They would all tell you that if you follow in this particular direction, you're going to awaken into a higher level of consciousness that is generally referred to, oh, we call it the soul line, as love. As love, pure and, pure and simple. What does that mean? But if we, if who we are are divine beings having a human experience, how can we become more of what we already are? If you're a divine being, your nature is love. Our first principle in loyalty to your soul is the nature of God is love. Every one of the world's religions agreed on that. Well, how, how can I become more of what I already am? You can't. You can't. What you can only do is awaken to that which you are. And therefore, you hear people talk about walking around asleep. Lots of things written about we wake up from our sleep, we wake up from the maya, we wake up from the dream, we become more enlightened, we wake up. And that's true. That's exactly what happens. It's as if we're walking around with shades and we take them off one layer at a time, and we start to see clearly. We start to see more clearly. Now, what's interesting is that at this time, because of all of this change that is going on, let's say that you're successful and you start to move up this soul line so let's say you get up to here. The higher you go, you have a very interesting, uh, I can't say problem, it's not a problem. You find yourself in an interesting position. Very interesting position. Because the higher you go, 
the more you're going to can be confronted with a situation where you don't belong in this world the way you thought you did. How many people can relate to what I'm talking about? Okay. So we start to find that the things that used to satisfy our parents and grandparents, that's not, that's, uh, it doesn't work for me anymore. The structures that exist worldwide, they don't really work anymore. That's why they're all falling apart. It's not a bad thing. The old has to come apart so the new can emerge. People who are born into that stream, a lot of them are having a really hard time. If you want to read a book about that, read the book um, Indigo Adults. It would be a good, a good book to read. As you go higher, you realize you're, you, you want freedom. You don't want to be constrained. You want to be creative. You want to interact with people in a way that's not defined by tribes and not defined by sects and that's the said all of that is what's dying so here's the question where in the world do you go for an education that is specifically designed to assist you in learning how to live life successfully at that level as a person who's awakening into what is being born onto this planet at this time. It's a whole new ball game. It's not been done before. You know, and we get people uh, who come as our graduation speakers. Neil Donald Walsh is going to be our graduation speaker this year. Uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Jean Houston, Bernie Siegel, I mean, you name them, they've probably been speakers here. And I always ask them the same question, because they travel all around the world teaching. And I always ask them, I said, can you tell me where else that you're aware of that this kind of education is being done? And they say, we're not aware of anywhere. That scares me, in a way. So I want you to just get the, the sense of what it is that we're talking about. This is, this is radical, but it is the thing that people who are ready to hear it are... So we think of USM as one of the few places and that we can offer a master's degree in it is almost astonishing, where that's the level of what it is that we're working on here. And I'm going to go into greater detail in just a moment to show you uh, what I mean. But if you, we're going to be adding to this, uh, to this particular slide, so I don't want to... Ah, let me try it. What the heck? We'll have fun. <laughs> so I think that if I touch that, I can write on this thing now. <laughs> 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 Let's see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> Technology! <laughs> Way back in 1965, <laughs> Abraham Maslow, who is a great psychologist, talked about a hierarchy of needs, and he drew it this way, that needs get uh, um, fulfilled as people go up in higher levels of consciousness. So the first one is survival. So if you think about it, I'm not going to write them all, but you'll get the idea. Most of the people on the planet are, deal, are, are living, this is a distribution of people, numbers of people on the planet, are dealing at this level. That's survival. If you look around the world, you see it. The evening news is nothing more than a report of what's going on in a lot of places that are operating at these levels of consciousness. It's not bad. Everyone is learning what they need to learn. Next one up is uh, security and safety. <laughs> and if you look around the world, you know, the whole purpose of terrorism is to disrupt that, make people 
bring them back down to their need for safety and security. So you start getting up here, you've got to come out from all of that. You have to know how to raise yourself from these levels going on inside. And that's what spiritual psychology is all about. So I just throw this out, you know, for 30 some odd years of experience. People grow because they realize they will never, ever fulfill what they are capable of fulfilling by achieving goals in physical world reality. It's not going to be found there. It never will. Why is that? Because there's always more. There's always more. Fulfillment is to be found going up the soul line. Why? Because there, when you enter into the greater, greater levels of loving, you realize Loving is the thing you've been looking for, and it's the same for everybody. There's no better loving. It's, a, it's an energy. So what do we mean specifically? What are we talking about specifically? How does this relate? How do you work with this? So we start by quoting one of our favorite mystic poets, Jalaluddin Rumi. He said, your task is not to seek for love. If you don't want to, you can't seek that. Your task is merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. And to that, the great international duo, Ron and Mary Hulnick, have added, <laughs> and to resolve them, and to drop them, and to let go of them. So spiritual psychology is the whole system of how you do that. And I'll, I'll briefly run through it so you get the sense of what I mean. So now I'm talking about an individual person. Talk about myself. So another way to think of physical world reality is there's a physical level. It's how I relate to everything going on in the world. My job, my relationships, uh, where I go to have breakfast, I mean, all of those things. As I start to go inside, there's this thing called the mind. My thoughts, my attitudes, what I think about things, the definitions that I have decided are true about the way things are or the way they should be. If I go deeper inside, there's this other level called the emotions. We call this the yo-yo level. And sometimes they're up, and sometimes they're down, and sometimes they're up. And they seem to have a mind of their own. It doesn't seem to be related to anything that, that I can figure out. And those two levels taken together, the mental and the emotional level, that's a great definition of what an ego is. So you hear psychologists talk about the ego. That's what your ego is. It's that part of you that's your mind and your emotions, and they work together. So the mind has a thought. The emotions give you energy so that you can transform that thought into action in physical world reality. Without emotions, you, if you just had a mind, you couldn't, you couldn't really do anything. So we have enough energy, then we get to do work in physical world reality. So there's another level, the unconscious level, we don't go delving into the unconscious level. We have found over time, it's unconscious for a darn good reason. <laughs> There's stuff in there that you probably don't want to be aware of. <laughs> and if you have come to a place where you are ready to deal with the next thing that's in there, it will be revealed to you. You really don't have to be concerned about that. So we just deal with that stuff when it comes up, but we certainly don't do any excavation into the unconscious. Now these levels all have duality. Just like we talked about before on the physical level, it, this is just another way of saying it. So we have positive experiences and we have negative experiences and they align. So if you believe that you have a great job, you're going to feel good going to work in the morning. It just, it just follows. 
whatever you believe, your feeling will be in accordance with that belief. If you believe you have a crummy job, you're not going to go to, you're not going to feel good going to work in the morning. And so a lot of our lives become about attempting to move things from here into here. So, okay, that is the way that psychology has worked up until this point. So now we introduce spiritual psychology. What are we saying? We're saying there's another level. There's a level that we refer to as the authentic self the deepest level that we're aware of inside of ourselves. What's going on there? Well, unconditional love. All the time. No duality. That's all that's ever going on there. And its derivatives, peace, acceptance, joy, compassion, beauty, these are all qualities of the authentic self. When we, the higher we go into the authentic self, the more life becomes about experiencing those and the less it becomes about stuff that's going on up in here. So how do we work with that? Let's assume Rumi knew something about what he was talking about. How do we work with that? What are these barriers he was talking about? So in the video, Dana talked about the second year project, which was writing a book. So. I mean, who am I to write a book? I mean, it's, uh, who would want to listen to me? All that kind of stuff. So that would be what we refer to as limiting beliefs. So in the second year project, because it was a home assignment, those beliefs got challenged. How they get challenged? You must write a certain number of pages a month if you're going to complete the book. Write them. You know, no excuses, just write them. So, all right chunk it down. She wrote 40 pages. But now look at what has happened. 40 pages worth of what used to be negative energy has now become positive energy. Can you see that? The, the line is now over here. So she's transformed 40 pages of what used to be negative energy into positive. She proved to herself, at least 40 pages worth, that she is worthy to write a book. Now the fun begins. Now the fun begins. Because a message now goes out in consciousness, because notice she's out of balance now. Not a problem. All learning takes place this way. I mean, if, if we knew it already, it wouldn't be learning. So all learning converts what's unknown into what's known, experientially, experientially. The message goes out, hey, Dana wants to move her uh, balance of consciousness to match the 40 pages that she has written. So far, so good. This is what she was talking about. Guess what? All of the mental and all of the emotional and whatever unconscious material that previously supported why she hadn't written anything in her book is going to come bubbling up to the surface for you to deal with. What kind of stuff is that? Unworthiness is going to be a big one. Uh, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. All of that kind of stuff. So what do most educational systems teach you about how to deal with that? Well. At best, it would be nothing. At worst, it would be stuff that takes you in the wrong direction. Let's say that she's successful. What happens? She moves over. She has gone up the soul line by that amount, whatever that amount is, and now she's ready to write the next 40 pages. It's this business of learning I'll call it a technology for want of a better word, of how to take these things out of consciousness that are disturbing our peace and heal them. And we say heal them for the last time. That is what this program is all about. Well, why does it take two years? Couldn't you just do it in one weekend? Uh, no, no, is the simple answer. 
These are not changes that happen easily because the ego will hold on to the way it was because it defined it that way. Remember, mind what we believe to be true. If you have beliefs about yourself that are limiting, you will create your life accordingly. So we challenge those and we have ways of letting go of that stuff. How do you know if you have an unresolved issue? I mean, why would I assume that you have an unresolved issue? You might be the first introductory evening people to have no unresolved issues. Because we're a school, we have a test. Do you ever find yourself doing this? I am upset because. I just had a neighbor running that on me yesterday because we were watering too much and the water was going into her pool. Sorry. You know. <laughs> I'm upset because Ron and Mary's water is, is running into my pool. If you think about this, this is rampant on the planet. This is rampant on the planet. This is the way we were brought up. To think that things out there disturb my peace. And whenever that thing happens, my peace gets disturbed. Pure and simple. So why can't we do this in a weekend? Because it's going to take you more than a weekend to get over that idea. That one doesn't die easily. <laughs> believe me. Believe me, it doesn't, it doesn't die easily. We have cherished things. We have cherished becauses. <laughs> Ones that, yeah, you can't mean that one. I'll give everyone up but that one. No, no, that's the first one that has to go. I'm upset because. So what's the alternative? Well, oh, here's some of our favorites. We took a survey of, uh, of students just to get a sense of of some of their favorite I'm upset becauses. It's okay. Here was the number one. You don't listen to me. To partners in relationship. Always remember the woman who stood up in class and you know, she said, my boyfriend says I don't listen to him. That is so hard to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yep. How about this one? People don't understand me. People should understand me. It's a rule. Everybody knows that. People should understand me. When they don't, I get upset. Rightly so. It's their fault. I'm upset because life is unfair. There's a rule somewhere that says life is supposed to be fair. And when that rule gets violated, I have justifiably become upset. I get upset at myself. I don't behave like I should. I mean, I really know better. No, you don't. <laughs> if, if you really knew better, you would do it differently. It's just a justification that, that, we, that we utilize. And when all else fails, when all else fails, if you run out of upset, you can always go to traffic is terrible <laughs> if you live here in L.A or New York, or some other, some other big city. And if that doesn't work, you can always use the IRS, or the politics, or whatever your favorite I'm upset because is. This is a total victim position. It's a total disempowered victim position. Where is the power? It's in the people who are upsetting me. Whatever, they have the power to determine whether I'm going to be upset or not. That's a big key. If you think about it, on an individual basis, this is called suffering and individual uh, disharmony. Let's call it that. When we run around with, I'm upset because we suffer. Suffering is the feedback that's telling us something is not, is not aligned in your consciousness. On a relationship basis, 
It's called marital strife. It's called, uh, it's called problems with spouses and parents and all of that kind of stuff. It's why the divorce rate is so high. I'm upset because my partner doesn't relate to me the way that they should. And of course the partner is saying, well, I'm upset because you don't relate to me the way you should. And if you think about it, there's no way out of that. There's no way out of that. On a national or an international basis, that's the stuff of war. I mean, what's a war? It's a bunch of people saying, we're upset because you're doing this, when you should be doing this, and the other group saying, well, we're upset because you're doing this and you should be doing this. So there is no way out of that. So the war goes on. The way the planet is evolving, that will be stopping before too long. Because it's outgrown its usefulness. It's an old format. It's an old structure. It's an old way of being in the world. We're coming out from that. So well, what other possibility is there? Consider what Rumi was talking about. Our task is to dissolve the barriers that we have placed inside of ourselves, that we're the ones who set that up, that this is all spiritual work, and that is the nature of the work, to heal these misunderstandings that are going on inside of ourselves. So what happens if we enter into what we would call the model of personal responsibility, where when I get upset, the first thing that comes into my mind is forget about what happened out there. Work with the fact that you are upset and there's an upset going on inside of you right here and right now. Quit blaming it out there. Is there a way you can heal it? Complete it so that when that thing happens, it doesn't disturb your peace. There is. And that's what the nature of this work is about. Can we identify and get a hold of these places inside? Do we know where to look for them and how to do that inquiry? Such that we can heal that upset and dissolve it. And that's a happy day, my friends. That's a happy day. What happens then is it transforms and what we find is that I am loving, that is what I truly am. That's that movement into the authentic self that we talked about. That's what happens when one has the experience of awakening into the loving essence of who they truly are. When I awaken, will I stay there? Not a good question. <laughs> so that's a goal-oriented question. Better question. Can I learn the technology so that whenever that happens, I know what to do to get myself back into the loving? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Of course, what you have to give up, you have to give up that very convenient, comfortable thing about making other people wrong and blaming them for your own inner disturbance. And what does it look like? We put this together because it was just kind of fun. So most of us are running around in the I'm upset mode. The ego is in charge. And there's this little authentic self, and we, we, it's referred to as the still small voice within. It's there, but it's like it doesn't get a lot of air time, and it's not very loud. <laughs> so you start resolving issues. You start resolving issues what begins to happen is this. The more you awaken, the more you become, uh, I don't want to say driven, that's not the right word, the more you become directed from your authentic self, the place of loving inside. And then the ego takes its rightful position as that part of you that allows you to work and do work in physical world reality. You have to have an ego. You understand if you just were authentic self, you would just sit there in a chair all day, you know, or in a cave, your choice. Uh, if it were me, I'd need a cave near a Starbucks. 
I mean, there's, there's a practicality to this whole thing, you know. <laughs> but this is what starts to happen to people. As they go through the program, there are a number of graduates here. I say, they will tell you that. I hope they will tell you that. You know? <laughs> I suspect they will tell you that. Uh, we have current students. They will tell you the same thing. Life starts to be more about the expression of who you are and not about all your complaints about the way things should be. So if you get the sense of what I'm talking about, very often people ask, what's the value of a USM, a USM education? Well, for one thing, you're going to get a better job. You will get a better job, even if it's the job you already have, because you'll show up in it differently. You'll get a better relationship, even if it's the relationship you already have. You'll show up in it differently. I mean, just think about how your relationships with certain people in your life would change if you got real clear that they're not the reason you're upset. They are just triggering upsets already present inside of you and are some of your biggest allies because they're showing you where you have work to do. What if you just approached it from that point of view? You do get a master's degree, which is state approved. It has validity to it. And you do get a superior skill set. We're fortunate. One of our grads is Mike Murphy. He's the retired CEO of the Mars Company, you know, the people who do M&Ms. And uh, when he was CEO, he was CEO for 35 years, something like that. Uh, they had offices and factories in 76 countries. I mean, it was huge. He told us one day, he said, if I knew about USM when I was CEO of Mars, I would have been at every one of your graduations recruiting. Why? He says, because your students have a superior skill set. They know how to be in relationship with themselves and other people. It would have saved us millions of dollars because business is all about relationship. I never thought about it that way, but he was, he was absolutely accurate. So at USM, we say it's all about how you show up. It's all about how you show up in life. We say USM gives you an edge. We see that. We're seeing that now because we were just in about halfway through this program that we just launched this year, which is a soul-centered professional coaching program where people are learning how to be, how to earn a living, utilizing the things that they really want to do without being mired down in all the structures that a lot of jobs put you in. And they excel because of this superior skill set. So I hope you'll forgive me by concluding with a pun. USM gives you an edge, which is why we call it education. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. So if you can get a sense of what I was just sharing with you, it'll, it'll give you some small sense of what it is that we do here and what the rationale behind it is. This is the stuff of education of the future. Make no mistake about it. Because people can't continue running this I am upset because stuff. Because evolving people can't evolve as long as they're doing that. 